So I hope everyone had a good week. Um, I'm interested to see, sort of hear what people messed with, but in a, just let me sort of share my screen and um, we'll talk a little bit about what we're gonna do this week. So. All right, so um, this week I'm, we're gonna walk through sort of some inspiration projects. These are projects that um, Pretty much every, everyone, every one of these projects is from Runway, um, but it's pretty helpful and interesting to sort of see what other people are producing and maybe give you some ideas about uh, things you can make. Um, again, ideally, like the hope is that by the end of this class, like you have at least one project you're pretty excited about. Um, there's no requirement for that, but it's just that I find that people like tend to um, do a little bit better when they're sort of like tasked to like do something in a certain direction. Um, so we'll see how that works. And then we're just gonna explore a couple of different models uh, today. We're going to look at um, using the vector input um, in Runway, which I don't know if anyone ran into, or we talked about it a little bit at the end of class last time. Um, but we'll look at it a little bit more in depth, and we'll talk about what vectors are in general. And then we're also going to look at style transfer. Um, there's like eight different style transfer models inside of Runway, so we'll talk a little bit about how they work, and then we'll look at some of the different um, aspects of each one of them. Um, so today we're going to do just like we'll kick off a little bit of group chat. Um, I saw Eric added some stuff to the Slack channel, which is awesome. Um, if you want to share other projects they worked on or questions they have based on sort of what they were doing with, uh, this week, um, we can do that as well. And then uh, we'll just start kicking off and we'll start to do some lecture stuff and then we'll do some demoing um, at the, toward the end of class. Sound good? Awesome. Um, cool. So um, if you haven't got a chance, I think Eric just put uh, his piece into the Slack channel, but it's pretty cool. Um, Looks like he was playing around with the shape matching GAN, um, which is also a really cool model. I've tried to do custom training in that and it is not easy. So um, clearly whatever they were doing was, is pretty cool. Uh, so it looks like you got the, the flame to work. Is that right, Eric? Do you want to talk about it? Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, all right. Uh. Sorry, my it's it's really warm here today. My computer is just fried at the moment, okay. unfortunately. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I, I I've been working on some lettering. I know it's very illegible, but it says boring, if you can make it out. Um, but I was messing around with. I went through the paper, which really helps understand kind of like, or it's a little more insight to what the function is, and so. Um, loaded something that was bold that I saw in their examples that might work. But then I messed around with their sliding. Um, they had a Gaussian blur um, uh, slider on there. And so literally like as I blurred it, I would just take uh, not screenshots, but just save a low res version, I believe. And so I think this was like 32 images that I'd saved and then brought it into Photoshop and then made it animated. Uh, GIF. But yeah, I was really happy with how it, it turned out. But other GANs that I worked on, I hit a wall pretty hard, except this one. Uh, what would you say was the wall you ran into for the other ones? Um, maybe just more of uh, the vocabulary I'm not familiar with, with like the, the vector I was trying to wrap my head around I'm like okay how do I make this work and then there I forget what GAN it was but they talked about semantic images um, that I also just try to look through the paper and like I think this is above my pay grade <laughs> <laughs> so questions cool. for later yeah definitely um yeah I mean I will add that like the papers are generally like half math and half like some pretty complicated stuff and um, you know, I've been reading a lot of papers for like the past two years and even I struggle with most of them. Um, but I think to your point, like if you look through the images, you can generally sort of see, um, what people are trying to do. And, you know, after you read a couple of them, you start to sort of learn how it works. And once you start to play with them a little bit more, um, it can also help a lot. So, um, yeah, we'll definitely take a look at vector inputs today and, and talk about how that sort of works. And then we'll, um, I can look at some of the, I think the segmentation analysis is also something that like. Um, I think I have one project of someone who does some segment stuff and we'll look at how that works as well. Um, 
maybe not this week in depth, but like if anyone's interested in it, I can talk about it a little bit more. Um, anyone else want to share sort of what their explorations were like this week? You're welcome to just unmute yourself and start talking. I can, um, I can share my screen really quick and show you a couple images. Yeah, please. Um, so I did the, uh, is it Big Bigan? I'm not sure if that's the right way to say it. Um, yep. um, and I didn't have any like expectations of what would come out, um, but I wanted to, and I didn't read the paper. I was just like, ah, let's just see what happens. Um, so I put in like a couple different images just to see like what would pop out the other side. Um, and it was just crazy. Like the variety of stuff went from like really abstract and cool to like mildly disturbing shapes. Um, so threw in uh, one photo of a person that was like had a really strong color background and then a second portrait, which again, brought some like really disturbing stuff. But once you got into the more like abstract ranges of things, like it got really interesting and cool. And like this kind of texture is really dope. Um, and even this is like almost um, felt like really, um, I don't know what the word I'm looking for, um, scrapbooky and uh, words are failing me right now, I'm sorry. No, it's fine. So for these, were, were each one of these images, were, was the input, did you just like ran the input multiple times, you got different outputs or was it no. like? Okay, oh, that's yeah. a great question. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I was playing a lot with Gaussian Blur as well. And that was kind of like really generating some of these crazier ones mm -hmm. out here, um, but also playing a lot with um, the invert to like basically effectively reduce the contrast. Um, oh. and, and then it's sometimes like, I was playing with everything really just to see what would come out. Um, awesome. Um, but as I like got into, I started playing with this water texture and I was like, oh, it's actually like generating some bodies of water. It's trying to make it, uh, like you can tell that it's trying to render um, uh, a bird, um, which I don't even think I mentioned, but Big Bigan, um, like the idea is to generate similar images based on the input image. Um, so ideally it would be kind of doing something like this, I think. Um, and so like once I got that, I was like, well, let me just put a duck in there and see what happens. And it started to actually produce some stuff. It also produced some dogs as well, which I thought was really funny. Um, and then just for fun, um, I just pulled in an, Im uh, an image on Pinterest that was like, this is not um, like an organic image at all, um, just to see like what it would produce. And like, once I started like playing with the Gaussian Blur, again, started to like generate some like really interesting images, but like obviously the out, like, <laughs> doing some direct things it was just like throwing in random objects which was pretty fun um but all in all really cool um and like produce some weird stuff um as well as some like interesting um images so yeah yeah i think that's a great example of like where you started just playing with it and sort of just seeing what you could produce and then you sort of realized what it was meant to do and you were able to sort of like when you added that duck photo, it, it's clear that it's like a little bit more along the lines of like what you would expect the model to do, right? It's like duck in, duck out. Um, yeah. And then again, you went back to like just playing with it and seeing what happens when you throw like flat, like fields of color into it. So I think it's like, that's exactly like what is sort of cool about these models. You can see what it's meant to do and then you can like break the rules and produce other weird images from it. That's awesome. Um, anybody else wanna share? I could go. Uh, let me share yeah. my screen. Cool. Uh, wow, hang on. <laughs> There's a, I just, I just got like a new computer. And oh, yeah, yeah. Permissions Zoom will be mad for a while. Yep. Cool. Um, um, well, you got that set up. Does anyone else? Oh, you got it. The yeah. Okay, cool. Cool. Um, so I went through a couple of models here just to try things out because I didn't really. Um, it, it was funny, I, I kind of got, I don't want to say bored, but I want to say that there were certain, I kind of, yeah, I kind of hit walls with specific models um, trying out things. So I just figured I'd keep trying out other ones. 
Uh, go through big by gun first. I, I I did I did some I spent some time putting together like a couple of data sets that I wanted to work with. Uh, one of them was just a bunch of really old uh, South Asian art from like the yeah going back to like the 10th century all the way to like the 1800s and. I figured that with Big Bygan, like because the stuff is like fairly detailed and intricate, I wouldn't get anything remotely similar. It would get pretty weird, and that's kind of what happened. Um, so like, there's no real sort of sense of how this is related to this, maybe except for the colors. Um, I threw in a couple of other things that I guess were more sort of pattern-like, and those were the ones that I noticed were a little bit um, similar. The dogs one threw up something like a dog, <laughs> um, and then stuff that's more sort of architecture based also you can sort of see what the pattern it's trying to replicate is i guess um and then some other stuff i guess where it's just using the color um and this i guess you know you're, you're sort of seeing the overall idea of something in the black background um this as well not really particularly impressive um i went through deep dream as well uh i i found deep dream interesting because it seemed like when i was reading about deep dream it sort of said that the um, the patterns that they talk about enhancing are specific to the images, but if you look, I mean, at least in my experience, it felt like all of the images were getting like a similar pattern, like it was just throwing a specific filter onto the images. Um, so I wasn't really sure about that. Um, what else? Like I went through, I guess, like style transfers are just pretty straightforward. There were certain ones that I liked better than others. Um, and then I went through Bassnet and Yule Act, which are sort of really simple um, models and not necessarily generative, I think. Uh, Bassnet just, just takes out the background. I tried to fool it with a couple of images. So mm -hmm. this one doesn't really have a foreground, so it sort of gave me, gave me nothing <laughs> except for that. Um, but yeah, it seemed like, um, especially with Big Black Gun, it's a, as it stands, um, trying to do something that's super intricate wouldn't sort of get me anywhere um, in terms of trying to recreate something similar. Cool. That's awesome. I'm glad you went through a bunch of different models. And I think what you'll find in general is that a lot of the models inside of Runway um, have sort of like size limitations. So anything you try to do that's com complex, it scales the images down to like 256 or 512. So then you lose a lot of that detail. Um, and that's just sort of a limitation, a little bit of sometimes the model, but also sometimes Runway. Um, but it's cool that you sort of experimented with it and um, I personally find that the Deep Dream version inside of Runway is really hard to use. I don't know why. Um, I, I used to, actually in the last class I taught that did this, I actually, um, I taught the Deep Dream and I was just sort of like so disappointed in the Deep Dream version that I just sort of like stopped prom uh, like sort of presenting it or demoing it in this class. Um, there's other good versions and I'll link, um, I'm going to start taking notes for myself here, but I'll add a link for um, anyone that's interested in doing Deep Dream stuff. There's a there's what's called a collab notebook and collab is basically like, um, it's a thing by Google and it basically like lets you run code in a, in what they call cells. If you ever used like a Python notebooks or Jupyter notebooks, it's like that. Um, I'll share a link with that. Like I find that one to be really, really good. And I actually did, I did like a, a, a live stream YouTube like demo on how to use it. So if you want to just watch that, like you'll get much better results out of that one. And it's actually written by the guy who invented Deep Dream. So um, it's definitely like pretty clear and like super powerful. Um, but yeah, like the other downside of this, and we'll talk about this a little bit when we get into style transfers, is that sometimes the models that they run in Runway are meant to work really fast or to work like really instantaneously. And that means that sometimes the uh, the quality of them is lower because it's sort of like, it's supposed to be like real time. So therefore you might not notice as much of that. And I think that's what's, I think that's what's going on with the Deep Dream model in there is it's meant to be run from like a video sort of real time. So like you don't necessarily know that like, when you do a sample image, you're like, this looks bad, but like on a, on a video it might not be as clear that that's uh, happening. Um, yeah, so that's that's really um, really cool. I'm glad you got to play with a bunch of pieces. And I will also say, like, in my experience, um, many people sort of hit a wall with the, sort of the models that already exist in, inside of Runway, just because they are pretty limited. Like in terms of creativity, they can be they can be a little bit harder to like find creative ways to work with them. Which is why a lot of people get really excited about doing training. Um, and we'll obviously talk about that uh, in week three and four about like training your own model because then it feels like yours and it feels like there's cool things to start to play with. Um, so yeah, there's definitely, um, definitely like different instances of this sort of thing. So I think it's, um, yeah, I think there's, we'll, we'll see how people feel about it in the end, but I think there's definitely some cases where this is true. 
um, that you do hit walls, especially inside a runway. Um, awesome, I saw some other folks added some, I'm gonna share my screen and then we'll, we'll walk through some of the stuff that's in uh, the Slack channel as well. So thank you for adding that. Um, again, there's no requirement to add it to Slack, but I do find that it's, um, it's a little more fun because then people can sort of see what people are making throughout the week. And you can also like then respond to people and just sort of say like, hey, like um, what did you do here? Like that sort of thing and talk a little bit more. So, um, you know, I know it's like, nobody feels like most of us are probably doing our work like the day before class starts or whatever, but um, feel free to throw stuff in in the Slack channel as, as needed. Um, so Anton, it looks like you did uh, a cloud generator. Was that with uh, a style gam model? Yeah, it was with um, a vector um, style gam. I think it was uh, just like a vector modifier. Like you cool. would just, yeah, play with the parameters. I got a bunch of them. I just kind of uploaded a few. A lot of the ones I were um, tried were in that like vector world. There's like a tattoo one that I just ordered or just added at the bottom. And then there was an emoji cool. one that I played with too. It was pretty fun. You just get awesome. like cut horrific. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll talk a little bit about the style gam models um, and training times. I, my guess is that many of these models that are inside of style gam are what I would describe as under trained, meaning that like they've only been trained for like maybe the free version you get, which is 3000 steps. And my general recommendation is to train them a little bit longer. You get better like sort of forms after you train them longer. So um, some of the free style gam models in there are a little, little gnarly. This one definitely looks pretty weird. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll start talking about that this, this week as we go through vectors. Um, and then definitely when we hit training, we'll talk a little bit more about it as well. Uh, and I see you, you did a deep dream one as well, right? Mm -hmm. Cool, that one looks pretty interesting. Yeah, they get pretty psychedelic. <laughs> Yeah, they do. Um, and a lot of it has to do with how many iterations you run it for, as well as some of the other, there's a lot of like sort of um, like esoteric uh, like values that you input into those deep dream models that can make it a little bit harder to understand. Um, yeah. Cool, and Kara, it looks like you did a video. Yeah, I posted a few. This was um, a test I did just because I was curious about how the different, uh, a few different ones worked. One is the same model that uh, someone was using for text up above um, with the, I think it's lightning or water plus fire or something like that as the uh, texture. And then mm -hmm. that's um, connected with a uh, video that had the background removed in some weird ways. A, vid a video without a clear foreground that had the background removed and cool. just kind of seeing how that all fit together. Um, but then the stuff under it is, um, I, I was curious what, uh, I always say it big, big GAN in my head, but big by GAN um, <laughs> could, would do with the green screen video. And oh, cool. so it tested on some green screen footage. It, it gave some weird results, obviously, um, green and blue screen. And I might mess around with that a little further. I also did a stop motion one that was not as successful, but I'm curious if a stop motion plus green screen video would have like super weird results. Um, just because oh. it would form already in the same kind of way. And then the next one, I had already been training this one for fun. It's a goosebumps model. <laughs> oh, nice. Um, it's not, I, I think I probably need to know a little bit more about the training images first, but. Yeah, I mean, what's interesting about this is like, and, what's, and we'll talk about this again when we also do training is like you get the cover, like the, the actual like title, like R.L. Stein Goosebumps, like stays like relatively like the same, which is pretty cool. And then you get sort of this messiness in the middle and that's probably just due to, we'll talk about this more next week, but it's probably due to just the diversity of images. Um, it might just be too, too much of a diverse, image set inside of it. But it's still interesting that like, this works pretty well for the actual Goosebumps content, right? It's like pretty horrific sort of things. So it's kind of interesting that it like, does sort of generate uh, more abstract versions of Goosebumps covers. <laughs> cool. All right, awesome. Um, cool and awesome. All right, cool. I'm really glad to see people like adding stuff. Um, <laughs> Matthew, I'm interested, what, what was your different versions? Of, oh, these are all Steve Buscemi. Uploads? Well, it's they just ended up looking like Steve Buscemi, okay. <laughs> which which I thought was awesome. Um, yeah, I, I went down a um, a rabbit hole of of creating uh, Steve Buscemi looking fine art. 
<laughs> was this using um, the wiki art style GAN model? Yes. Okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, my friend Peter is the one who made that and it's pretty cool. It's pretty amazing how, like, so if you compare this model, so like this was not trained inside of uh, Runway, this was trained separately and then he uploaded the model mm -hmm. to it. And you can just sort of see like the results from this training because it probably took, I know it took him like three weeks to train this model compared to some of these other models that are trained in a couple hours. You'll see the, the difference in the, the realism is like dramatically different. Um, yeah. Also his architecture for the way that this works is like pretty crazy. He has like a custom architecture that is even like crazier than the normal Stalgan architecture. But yeah, yeah it's kind of interesting diversity, you can see the difference between these. The diversity ahead, of the yeah. images that you get through it is insane too. Super cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, you can't, you unfortunately can't do that within the runway style game model. Um, but yeah, it's, it's pretty interesting that uh, he did basically has like, I don't expect anyone to know what this means, but he has a style game model that also takes in class labels. So he's able to label all of his images. So it pulls from wiki art and it knows, oh, this is a, this is like a pointillism painting. This is, you know, a, I don't know, a Dutch whatever painting, like, you know, those like different styles of art. And then you're able to output that as well. It's pretty, pretty cool. Um, and yeah, the results are, I definitely see the Steve Buscemi, but it's also pretty interesting um, just to sort of see the different styles it outputs. Cool. Um, well, awesome. Um, please keep uploading stuff. Uh, these are really cool. Um, I definitely want to like sort of, we can talk about more and we can look at more after, uh, toward the end of class, just depending on how much time we have left. But um, thank you for sharing. Um, you know, I, the way I sort of approach this class is the first week I do just sort of like throw you at it and just be like, go have at it. Um, and then, you know, now we're like, we'll actually start walking through what each of these sort of mean, what the different variables or parameters inside the model can do. Um, so it's, you know, sort of want you to feel a little bit lost in this first week, and then we'll start to clear things up for you as we go through stuff. Um, but also, as always, if you're like ever like playing with the model and you're like, I don't know what this means, um, you're always welcome to like just drop a note in Slack, either DM me directly or just put a note in Slack and I can always respond um, if you are looking for some of them. Because you know, there's something like 200 models inside a runway and all of them will operate a little bit differently. So if you ever run into something and you're just like, I don't know what this is, like we can look at it together. Um, cool, so with that, I'm gonna start uh, just like sort of talking a little bit about other projects um, this week. So, you know, again, um, I think the idea is like, maybe by the end of class, you do have like a bigger project and like that can, that really doesn't mean it needs to be, be big or feel large, it just means like, Maybe you just have a project you're focusing on. Um, and I'll show a couple of projects from students from my last class who did make some stuff. And uh, maybe that'll sort of show you like, not the scope I expect, because again, you're not getting graded for this class, but just like what I think were some cool projects that came out of that, that class. Um, and also show you, so I'm gonna kick off, start with like just some projects of other folks who use Runway. Um, all these projects are linked to uh, the, like there's usually like a blog post or something else if you're interested in learning more about this. Um, so obviously, like I mentioned, like a lot of people will get really interested in training. And this is a really good example of um, a training model. So this is from a, a ceramicist. Her name is from, from Fran. Um, or that's her blog's name, at least. Um, and she trained all of her own pottery uh, in this model. Or I think it was partially her own work. And then some of it was stuff that she found from like various museums and things. Um, so she trained a model on pottery. Uh, and you get these really interesting results where you have sort of like these lopsided, like double-handled um, pots amongst other things and now she's using this model to sort of inspire her own work um, and this is one of the things that I'll sort of harp upon like in this class is like don't stop at just finishing a model like take it into whatever you want to do next with your own work um, that could be the model itself or it could be stuff like making a pottery like that's inspired by these things um, so it's a really great blog post that sort of walks through how how she did the training and what she's doing with it now um, Janelle Shane, if you're not familiar with Janelle Shane, I definitely recommend looking up her work. Um, she just put out a book recently that is about sort of, I think it's called AI Weirdness. And it's her job as, lady, as a researcher to explore all the weird things that happen within uh, AI. And specifically, she works a lot with text and works a lot inside a runway, um, journeying models and journeying weird things. Um, I'm going to play this and then I'll talk through like on the second time, like what is actually happening here. I have a feeling my internet's a little slow.
All right. Um, so what's happening here? So at, in the bottom right corner um, is obviously like a Star Wars film. Um, she is running Star Wars through uh, what I believe is called Deep Lab, which I think maybe this is Eric, maybe this is what you're talking about, which is the segmentation model. Um, so what is this doing? So it takes in a, a, a frame of a video and it tries to guess what segments are. So segments are basically um, outlines or shapes that it sees. Like it would, like if you see in this very still frame here, you can see it like kind of understood that a person is right here, right? And it sort of like recreates a person. So what it's doing is it's taking two models. It takes one that's just called Deep Lab and that converts it uh, into those, what are basically like flat vector shapes. Um, and those are categorized. So it'll turn the outline of uh, this person into red and it'll say that's a person. Um, and then she ports it into another model which is called Spade Coco. And that model then reads those color shapes and tries to fill in the shapes with an image. We'll look at another Spade Coco um, model in I think next actually. Um, but this is very weird in that she's basically like sort of unraveling the film and then putting it back together. So it's like you get segments and then you convert. So basically you take an image, convert it to segments and you take a, the segments and convert it back to an image. Um, and you'll see it just does some really like absurdly weird stuff here. Um, and I think this is linked to a, either a blog post or a Twitter thread where she kind of like stops at every frame and tries to describe like what it's seeing here. So I think in the example of these lightsabers, I think uh, the model decided it was a baseball bat or like some other like machine. So when you actually look at it, you'll see in some of these cases that it like converts it back to like a like wood bat type of thing. Um, but this is again a, a case of where like you can do some really weird stuff by sort of almost um, what I always describe as like the translation where you like you translate a sentence from English to German and then German back to English. Um, it's like a pretty common thing that people do within these models um, and you get some very funky results. Um, so I think, you know, Janelle is very, does a ton of work and there's lots of cool stuff if you're interested in checking out her work. Um, yes, yeah, so this is the other uh, Spade Coco version. So this is um, an artist, uh, Fabian Rashid. He actually built um, an iPad app that talks to Runway. So what he's doing is he's actually painting in these segmentation maps. So they're basically color coded. So you color code, you know, the sky is blue or whatever for water. Um, he built a little iPad app in like P5 um, and then has it so that he can paint these things live on, on an iPad and then it talks to Runway and it comes back with an image. So basically he's like drawing over the images he's making and then he gets stuff back. Um, really cool, I don't expect anyone to build an iPad app in this class in five weeks, um, but this is sort of the potential of things you could do, right? So if you are like a really familiar with JavaScript or know how to like use P5, um, you can make some really powerful tools for yourself and just have it talk back and forth to Runway. Um, so there's some really cool work here. Um, Fabian does a lot of work like this. Um, He's got a lot of cool things, so I definitely recommend checking him out. Um, Adam Picard is actually, let me mute this, um, is actually one of, a student of mine. Um, he was in my style again class. He made this before he joined my classes. Um, but so this is, I believe, trained in runway. This is um, a stained glass model. Um, so he trained just a 2D stained glass model. And then what he did is he brought it back into uh, like, after effects or cinema 4d and he used a, a light rendering system to render light through it um, which again i think is like this really cool aspect of like he obviously knows like 3d modeling very well um, he's able to take sort of what he makes in in runway and then brings it back into his own work um, and i think just the addition of adding this light casting through the the render makes it feel like so much different than just a pure style game model um, so Adam has been doing a ton of really cool work recently. Um, he did a bunch of like interesting, really like chair models recently. Um, done a lot of cool work. So I definitely uh, check him out as well. Um, also, I should say Adam and a couple other folks are in my Slack channels. So if you ever want to like reach out to them, um, they're all pretty welcome, welcoming and like happy to talk about their work and, and how to do things. So you're always welcome to reach out to people on Slack, which, you know, just be nice about it. So um, Andreas Refsgaard is like a pretty well-known European artist. Um, this model is uh, like, I think old vintage tin types from like the 1860s or whatever. Um, and then, so he did a style game model, but the tin types are all black and white. Then he used an app or he used a model, um, which I think is inside a runway. And if not, it's uh, readily available. It's called the Oldify, which converts black and white images into color images. Um, so this is sort of a style game interpolation, which we'll talk about more. 
um, in the coming weeks, and then it's brought into Deoldify to sort of colorize it. What I like is there's still like this, there's some morphing, but it also sort of jumps between places, which is really interesting. And then here's some work from students uh, in my last class. So um, Nye Warburton is um, an animation uh, artist. So he works almost entirely with animation and he was really excited to sort of start to bring these things into uh, various um, models. So he was taking sort of like uh, all Beyonce's all the single ladies and did a bunch of different stuff with it. Um, he's really interested in exploring what different models do in terms of like pose detection, like other things like that. So this is, I believe, uh, dense pose um, and it basically tracks the body position of all these artists. Um, so he also then, uh, this is a model called, and there's sound with these, um, I just needed it for my own sanity, otherwise I have to talk over like sound and stuff. Um, but he all, this is, uh, I forget exactly what this model is, but this is a model where you can talk. Um, and if you record a video of you talking, you can then um, face match anyone else's. So like here you see like all these famous paintings singing um, all the single ladies. Um, so just some really, really cool stuff. Um, Nye is definitely like, if you're into animation, Nye is the guy to talk to because he has a bunch of interesting techniques around some of this stuff. Um, we won't cover a lot of this in this class. This class is mostly about image generation and video generation. Um, but if you are interested in stuff like this, I definitely recommend reaching out to Nye. Nye is really interested in helping other folks get up and running on this. So uh, feel free to reach out to him. Um, Jason Powers is a graphic designer um, here in New York. Um, he was particularly interested in typography. Um, and I will say typography and StyleGAN is like a very hard thing to pull off. Um, it just like those models are not meant to be able to read typography very well. So what he actually does, um, this is actually two layers. So like the sort of blobby layer you're seeing is actually uh, his StyleGAN model. Then he, um, he overlaid the StyleGAN model on top of what the training results were. Um, so you're getting almost sort of this like duplicitous effect where you see some of the type like pe peeking through this model. Um, but then you also sort of see like the blurring and like the other weird parts of what the model does to it. Um, I think it's a really cool effect and it's like a good way to show that like, I think even if you're disappointed in what your style game model like produces, you can still find ways to make it really interesting and textural and like use it to keep making other interesting work. Um, so I think like he showed this to some people and they were like, how did you get text to work within style game? He's like, oh, actually it's just a like a little bit of a video trick, but it was really interesting to sort of see people get excited about this work. Um, and then April, uh, April is really, really interested in um, sort of, she does a lot of sketching. Um, she's also like big into travel, which I think right now is like kind of hard for folks, um, but she's sort of traveling around and she does a lot of these sketches of like places where she, where she is. So she has a lot of photos of where she's photographed her like drawing, like in front of a photograph of the place that she's, uh, she was actually visiting. Um, and then she ran that through a style game model and you'll see this like, really, really interesting thing of where in some cases, like it learned the drawing really well, but I would say it didn't learn the building particularly well. Um, and then in other cases, you know, uh, you're seeing a lot of like abstracts in both areas. Um, so I think it's really cool because I haven't ever seen anyone try to train two images in one model at the same time. Um, just really, really cool to see this sort of work together. Like again, like so many people in here will just like generate ideas and I will have never seen anyone do these things. Um, so this is really, really cool to see her next step from here was actually to take the drawings and she put them on like a pen platter and redrew them. So it's sort of like taking these things from like a like purely digital place and then bring it back to sort of the physical. So sort of like for her, it was um, drawings of places that don't exist or drawing of places she's never visited before. Um, so I think it was just some really, really cool stuff here uh, to play with and um, to think about. Um, so for you, I just want to, I want to also recommend that, um, you know, approaches for you, uh, I think it's really important that you bring a little bit of yourself to these projects. So whatever you're interested in, whether that's typography or photography or a certain collection of things, um, that you sort of bring that to your own work. Um, so, uh, you know, maybe there's something unique to the type of artwork you make. Maybe you just have a particular interest. Maybe you've been saving, you have a Pinterest board of 1200 images that you are like dying that you now have an option to use, um, any number of things. So, you know, it's also like, what do you have a lot of? Um, because a particular style again, you do need 500 to 1000 images. Um, 
So it does take a lot. Uh, you have to find a lot of images. And we'll talk about how to do that um, next week. And then lastly, like what skills do you have outside of runway? So in the case of someone like Nye, who's really good at animation, or in the case of Adam, who's really good at 3D work, like they're able to sort of like use these things as like a kit of parts or just components and they can bring it in their own work. Um, or in the case of April, like she was like, I'm really interested in drawing these digital things and, and bringing them into reality and, find, and found a way to do that. Um, so that's like a bunch of like just approaches. Maybe this will get you inspired a little bit to start thinking about work. Um, yeah. So I think what we're going to do now is let's take a quick break. I know it's a little early, um, but I actually have to run and get a power cord. So before um, my, my laptop dies, I'm going to go do that. So why don't we come back at uh, 747 or like 47, wherever, wherever you are. Um, so let's take a quick five minute break. I need to grab some water. It is getting warmer in here. Um, so I'll go do that uh, and we'll come back in like five-ish minutes. Cool? All right. See everybody in five minutes. Well, all right. Thanks everybody for dealing with that. Um, obviously this might be an issue. We'll see. Um, hasn't happened so far. So um, let's see, where do we stop? We stopped with um, just talking about sort of like models are a little bit slow. Were there other, were there other questions? There was another question that like is one of my headphones went crazy, right? Was there? I think someone right. asked about time. Right. Yeah. So I think, um, yeah, so some of the models are a little bit slow and I think um, it's sort of luck of the draw, whether it's slow to start up. Um, we would say like if you're waiting more than five minutes, that's generally a, a bad sign. Um, nothing should really take longer than five minutes to get started up. So um, yeah, just give it about that time. And if not, just stop it, quit runway, come back to it, see if it works. Um, yeah. Um, I don't, did I mention this before in class? Uh, yes, last week, but um, Runway also has a Slack channel. If you're not yet overwhelmed by all the various Slack channels that you're probably now a part of, um, there is a Runway Slack as well. Um, so, and I'll say like it's run by a pretty small company. So if you ever are interested in um, just sort of reaching out to them and saying like, hey, I think there might be a bug here or something like they're very quick to respond. Um, so this is what Runway Slack looks like. There's some stuff in here for feedback and debugging. Um, they're very interested in hearing feedback from artists and folks like you. So um, I'll post a link to this in our chat as well. Um, and you're always welcome to sort of like jump in there and say like, hey, I'm taking Derek's class. and um, now that will skip you to the front of the line, but it might get you a little bit further ahead because um, I do a lot of classes with them and they know um, to like keep you guys happy. So um, yeah, so it's always an op op option to like jump in there and ask about things as well. Um, and there are lots of other artists in there too. So if you ever just want to look, dig around and see what other people are making, um, you can do that as well. Uh, any other questions um, before I jump into the demos for this week? Cool, okay. Um, let's see if Chrome also crashed on me, which it probably did. Um, so uh, for the demo today, we're going to look at vector inputs, and then we are going to look at um, style transfer. So let's start with talking a little bit about vector inputs. I know a couple of you played around with this a little bit, and maybe you were a little frustrated trying to figure things out. Um, we'll talk a little bit about just vectors are. So obviously for a lot of us um, coming from like a design background, vectors mean Illustrator or Figma or something where it's like uh, what we call vector graphics. And vector graphics are not that different from actually how vectors are thought about here. So, um, you know, when you're using like the pen tool inside of Illustrator, right, you make a point and then you like sort of drag some handles out and you make another point, you drag some handles out. So what's actually vector about those things are that everything is a point-based system, right? So you have a little point here, those handles are points you can manipulate up and down, um, and then you have other points. So vectors in terms of how mathematics or mathematicians or scientists think about things are there points in space and they usually have a direction to them. Um, and that is where vector comes from in this model as well. 
Um, so you will often hear people in machine learning talk about what is called a latent space. Um, a latent space is, let's imagine this is a two-dimensional space. Let's imagine that um, this is a grid of images at every one of these points that you see here is an image, right? So let's say at this point is an image of a person that looks like this. And another point is an image of a person that looks like this. Now, basically imagine like, even though I've only got like 20 or 30 points here, imagine that this entire space is just a grid of lots of different little points. And basically if you pick an image that is closer to another point, so you pick two points, um, you'll see that these images are fairly close to each other, right? The difference is in hairstyle, um, a little bit of the facial features, but the background, skin tone, t-shirt color, all those things are similar. So this is a, a addition of like sort of, these two vectors are close to each other and therefore they produce similar looking images. Whereas again, if I take one that is pretty far away, um, I get two different images, right? So this is different facial hair, different hair structure, different t-shirt color, different background color. Um, these are like, uh, the further away you are in space, the, diff the more different your images will be. Um, and if you were to try to like basically chart a path, um, like just take every little point along this path um, and take an image from there, um, you might guess what you would get. You would get essentially a video or an interpolation. Um, this is what we call interpolation. All that means is you're going from one point in space to another. And as you hit all these other points, you're taking the sample of the image there. Um, so how does this convert to vector space? Um, so for a model that is a, a StyleGAN model, um, so StyleGAN uses what we describe as a 512 dimensional space. Um, basically that's like 3D, but like way, way more because um, our brains don't process anything beyond like 3D or 4D. Um, so don't try to think about it anything more than it's just like lots of different layers um, and all these layers produce an image. So, and what these are also called is they're called feature dimensions or feature vectors. Um, in an ideal world, this isn't really what actually happens, but the idea is that at one of these vectors or one of these spaces controls maybe your lip movements or whether you're smiling or frowning or have a neutral, uh, neutral space face, or one of these might be controlling hair color. So, you know, if you move all the way into one corner of the dimension, it's black hair. If you move all the way to the other corner of the dimension, it is blonde hair. Now it doesn't work like that in reality, but that is sort of the way to think about it is that some of each of these vectors implies some level of feature or some change of an image. Um, so if you are a JavaScript person or a coder, these are actually 512 dimensional arrays. So it's an array that goes from negative one to one um, for 512 dimensions. Um, so you can actually look at the vector and we'll do this in a minute. You can actually look and see what the vector is for each of these images. Um, so StyleGAN has 512. Now, most of the models inside of Runway are StyleGAN models. So most of these you will find um, have dimensional space of that size. BigGAN, I believe, has 128 dimensions. Um, the dimensions don't really matter. It doesn't, it doesn't imply that one image is, or one model is better than another. It's just how the model ends up like working. Um, so BigGAN um, has 128 dimensions. It also has classes. And we'll look at that as well. We'll look at a StyleGAN model and a BigGAN model. Those I believe are the only two models that use vector inputs um, in Runway, but because, um, because we, we end up using a lot of StyleGAN models, it's, it's helpful to sort of uh, know how this works. Um, so what Runway sort of does is it takes those 512 dimensions and it collapses them down to two dimensions. So if you use that vector input, you see that there's like a grid of images and that grid of images isn't like mapped, like up here is the actual like up here in the space. Um, but it's just a way of visualizing um, all the different inputs or all the different ways in which this model changes over time. Um, so the vector input is like actually something like special, like the, the vector grid is something special to Runway. And it's actually very, very helpful. Um, like I don't do a lot of training inside of Runway, but I still would bring in my model just to look at it. Um, because outside of Runway, you have like your, your dimensional array. And you just like tweak numbers and produce an image and look at it. Um, so actually the way that, that Runway manages that vector input space is really, really helpful um, and it's really good to understand. Um, so the other thing you'll hear, and we'll talk about this more, I think in the last week of class is we'll talk about like how do different, how do different types of animations or interpolations. Um, so I showed this example, which is just a, what's called a linear interpolation. And it's really moving from one, one point to another in a straight line. Um, we'll show an I'll show an example at the end of uh, the last week of class, um, which is called a noise loop. Um, 
all, you don't even, we don't even worry about it just yet, but the idea is that if you start at one point and you do this crazy sort of loopy path, you will get a bunch of different images. And if you come back to the exact same point, it completes itself, it's a loop. So one of the things that we'll do in this class is to generate like either animated GIFs or generate like a, a looping video for Instagram or something is we will actually do this. We will start at one point, we'll sort of do this crazy path through the space and then we'll come back to it and that creates a loop. So let's look at how this actually works inside Runway. Um, I had all this set up and I, because I restarted my computer, I now have a fun little um, world of having to restart this. Um, so let's take a look at some of these models in here. So um, the, one of the difficult things is you can't really say I want a vector input model. Um, that's not exactly how these things work. Um, but like I said, the, the main models that you'll play with that do have vector inputs are StyleGAN models and BigGAN models. Um, so let's take a look at a StyleGAN model. So usually to find a StyleGAN model, what I'll do is I'll come into category and I'll just click on community StyleGAN, um, just because that tends to be most of the StyleGAN models that people have trained on one way and then made public. Um, does anyone have a particular favorite style game model they saw in here that they want me to play with? No takers, okay. Um, I'm just gonna pick one. So I'm gonna pick, um, I'm actually gonna pick the Brutus architecture one and there's a reason why. Um, part of it is that, so, and actually let's just talk about this now. So when you click on some of these models and you wanna figure out like, you know, is this model good or is it bad? Partially you just generate things and you just sort of find out. But one way to, to test is um, when you come over to one of these and you click add to workspace. I have a feeling my machine is running very slow at the moment. There we go. Um, so you'll see over here that there is a thing called checkpoints and then there's a step. Um, this happened to be step 2000, which I think means it was trained rather a short period of time. Um, in general, and we'll talk about this more when we get into training, I like to train my models for at least 6,000 steps, um, if not more. Um, so finding a model that only has 2,000 steps means it's a little undertrained. Um, so I like to use the Brutalis Architecture one for these demos because it's a little bit more, it's a little bit longer trained. Um, but in general, like, it doesn't really matter for this demo. I just want to sort of like find a model that produces good images. So I'm going to add the Brutalis Architecture one. Um, so see, this is trained for 7,500 steps. So this is like a good, like this will definitely produce good results. It also has an uploaded, like when you hover over this, you can sort of see what the different results look like. Um, so to get this started, we're just going to come down here and we're going to click run remotely. Um, I do find style game models take a little bit of time to get set up, um, partly because they're installing a lot of code behind the scenes um, and they're pretty hefty in terms of their models. So usually these will take a little bit longer than other models. Um, but hopefully it's not like a five minute long time this time. Cool, actually that it's ready to go now. So uh, once it says stop, that means it's running. So I'm gonna switch the input to vector. It's the only option here. So I'm gonna switch it to vector. <clears throat> and it's gonna start producing a grid of images. Now, as this produces on the right hand side here, you'll see there is what we call inference options. And inference just means testing. Um, We'll talk about this a little bit more as we go through class, but inference just means make images, essentially. Um, there's a truncation value. I'll come back to this in a minute. And there's a vector options, which is sampling distance. So um, as you might imagine, sampling distance is essentially how wide of a space do we want to look at? Um, I don't know how this actually works in reality, but like basically if it's at one, you're going to show a lot of diversity. And if it's at zero, you're probably going to show the exact same image like over and over and over again. So this is a you know middle of the road. So you'll see that like each of these images produces slightly different results, right? So like um, even though they all have sort of most of them have sort of a grid uh, gridded sort of architecture structure, there is a good amount of diversity. Now if I turn this down pretty small, let's say I turn this down to point two, it's going to regenerate my grid, and you'll see that all of these images look a little more similar. Um, they're still pretty different, which is a good sign that this model is well-trained. Um, but you'll see that these have much more, they have this strong horizontal line through the middle of them. Um, they have a good amount of space that is like, they all look fairly similar, right? If you were to just quickly flash these up on screen, I might just decide they were pretty similar. Um, if I make this sampling distance, let's say uh, 0.8, and I hit return again. Now it's gonna generate 
like a bunch of different images. These are pretty drastically different, right? Um, you, know, you get different, slightly different color backgrounds. Um, you get different sort of images. Um, so the other thing to know is like you can scroll left and right. You just click and drag. So if you click and drag on this interface, um, basically what will happen is as you scroll to the right, it will produce more images, more like what's on the right hand side. And if you scroll to the left or up and down, it'll produce more images that are like more like these images. Um, now, because my sampling distance is pretty high here, it's still gonna generate like lots of different variation, but the idea is that it produces things a little bit closer to this space. Um, so that's sort of how this vector input works. Now, there's a couple of questions you might have here, which is like, oh, I really like this image. So if I click on it, <clears throat> you'll see that it produces this image down here in the preview. Um, and if I wanna save this image, I can pretty quickly just click here and hit save image. And this is gonna save it to my desktop. Now, let's say I wanna come back to this image like three weeks from now and also be able to like manipulate this space, right? So one thing you can also do is up here in the top hand corner, you can hit save vector. Um, and if I click this button, um, you'll see it says file saved. And if I click on that really quickly, It's going to pop up in the location where it was saved. Um, it is a JSON file. Some of you might know what JSON is. Um, but basically, you open this in a code editor. And of course, that flew off screen. Um, I'll drag it back over here. But basically, this is a vector of, this is the 512 dimensions of this. Let me um, grab this and let me hit view um, word wrap. Yeah. So. This is all the code that represents that image. Um, so what can I do with this? So let's say I wanna come back in here um, and work off this image again. Um, what I can do is I can come back over here and I can click on this top icon, which is load vector, click this. And I can click on this, this file that I just saved, open it again. And what it's doing now is it's reloading this image um, and it's finding results that are sort of similar to it. So if I were to crank the sampling distance down a lot more, let's get back down to 0 0.2. You'll see these are all images that look almost exactly similar to this particular image. Um, and this is sort of what's interesting about this space is that you've got all these images, um, but you can find ones that are really, really close to each other. Like I honestly can't even tell you what's different about these. Um, I can kind of tell that like whatever, maybe these doors or something down here are a little different. Um, but this is a place where like, let's say I really like this image, but I wanna make sure I have the perfect one of this. I could crank down the sampling distance and then look at these spaces and sort of experiment with this. Um, so this is all the vector grid is. It, it's a way to access these vectors in like a visual grid sort of appearance. Um, you can also, I believe, um, pinch to zoom. So if you wanna zoom in on some of these, you can as well. Um, this is essentially just an interface to explore the space of these style again models. Um, we're gonna use those vector inputs more um, in our own models in week five. We're actually gonna use these to be able to do some animations from them. Um, but this is what's available to us now. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about truncation. Also, I should, I should add one other thing. If you wanna regenerate your grid, but keep the same parameters, you just press this button down here in the bottom right, which is regenerate grid. Um, I don't expect anything to really change here because most of the images are the same. Um, but you can regenerate your grid. Oh, interesting. That actually gave me a totally random different vector. It wasn't aware that's how it worked, but there you go. Um, okay, so, um, so that sort of explains the vector grid interface. Now let's also talk about truncation. Um, truncation is a thing specific to StyleGAN, and it's kind of, it's very mathematical. It's actually hard to explain. But essentially the way that I would think about truncation is that um, anything closer to zero is going to be more realistic. Anything closer to one uh, is going to be more weird. Um, this is set at 0 0.08, which like seems like I'm still generating like pretty decent, relatively interesting buildings. Um, but if I were to put this at like 0.5, I should get buildings that look, although that totally doesn't seem right. The, the idea is that it should be more realistic, right? Like this building clearly is not super realistic. Now, if I crank truncation on a zero, I should get the exact same image almost like uh, for every image, let's just see if that happens. Yeah, so you'll see these images are much more closely to what is like the 
average image, um, and it's pretty similar. So truncation plus sampling distance can generate like different spaces. Um, I generally, my, my rule of thumb is to leave truncation at 0.5 or 0.7, somewhere in that range. Um, if you do crank it up to one, let's look at cranking up to one. So you'll get a much more diverse set of images, but the, some of these will clearly not look like they're as much of buildings, right? Like this has no like sort of building structure. It's a lot of wavy lines. Um, some of these buildings are sort of look like they already collapsed, those sort of things. Um, so you're welcome to play with truncation and just sort of see what you get with it um, and also play with sampling distance. Uh, I should also add that like within StyleGAN, like this is pretty much the interface you have. Um, there are some ways to export from this and let's look at exports really quickly. Um, so you could go through each one of these and just generate an image. Like say I like this image, I'm going to click on it and I'm just going to go ahead and save the image. You could do that one by one. Um, that's going to be a pretty laborious process. Let's say I just wanted to like generate a hundred images of this at random and just to see what I have. Uh, to do that is to go and export. Um, and you see there's two different options here. There's generate images um, and there's generate lint walk. Um, generate images will generate, you basically get to set um, like some settings here. So let's say I want um, 0.7 for my truncation value. And let's say I want to produce 100 images. Um, this will still, I was obviously still cost you the, the time it takes to run, but you can also estimate it. So it'll tell you how long it's going to take. Um, so it says, you know, 100 images at 0.01 uh, set, like one cent per image and it's going to cost a dollar. Um, so you go in here and you could run this. Um, I actually won't just because I don't want to jam up my runway, um, but I could do this. You can also, they just added this feature like two or three weeks ago. You can also generate late, random latent walks. Um, so again, sort of what we talked about, which is that interpolation. Um, you can generate random versions of that. Um, like it'll just randomly do a loop for you. Um, you can generate, um, like basically it'll generate, each one of these will generate its own video. So if you want to just say generate a video from this, um, you get to pick a number of keyframes. So keyframes are essentially like the points with these spaces. So it'll pick, you know, five points or it'll pick 10 points. Um, and then it'll pick how, like how many seconds you want between those points and then what your frame rate is for this video. Um, so if you go through this and let's actually just do one of these, I'm going to make this very, very short. Um, so let's leave this at, we'll do this at 10 frames a second. So it'll be a little choppy. Um, that should really just be um, an integer value. So let's just um, say we want five points and we want, uh, say, three seconds between each point. So that's going to be a 15 second video. Um, I'm, you know, we can look and see how much it's going to cost us. Um, this is going to cost about 50 cents. That seems fine. Um, so we're going to go ahead and export this. So what I'm going to do is I'll export this. I'll show us big GAN and then we'll come back and look at these videos. Um, so if you, when you hit export, this shows up in your exports tab and then it just starts a running process. Um, so once it's finished, it'll let you know. Um, so we're gonna run a, a latent walk. So there are ways you can make these sort of random latent walks. If you wanna control your latent walk, you can't really do that inside a runway specifically. So we're gonna look at how to do that in the last week of class using P5. Um, but you can generate sort of random videos if you just sort of do that um, at any point. Um, so let's go take a look at, uh, or actually, before I jump to begin, any questions about vector inputs specific to style again? Um, this might be related to what you were saying about that other model with the data labeling, but is there any way that you can, um, I guess, when, when we're training models, can you control any of that at all with labeling or with data, um, like the feature exploration? And yeah, controlling. not not inside a runway. Um, so if you are interested, like, I, and if you're really interested in experimenting more with this, I do have like, um, I have a StyleGAN class, so I teach everything, just like every little feature I know about StyleGAN. Um, I also just finished a class on that, and I have the videos up on YouTube. So if you're interested in a particular thing about um, learning about StyleGAN, I can point you to some videos, or you know, we're probably gonna run another session of that class in the near future. Runway has pretty limited capabilities in terms of what you can do with each training. It is sort of like. I don't want to say it's the training wheels version of machine learning, but it is a little bit uh, closer to like, you can't get crazy with stuff. 
Um, so StyleGam by in general does not do class labels or training stuff with data. Um, there are ways people have made, built models that you can do that, but you can't do it inside a runway. Gotcha. Cool. Yep. Any other questions? Uh, we'll talk a lot more about StyleGAN over the next couple weeks, but I'm definitely happy to field questions now as well. Adi? Um, I had a question about training. I remember you talked about a model that you thought was under-trained because it had 2,500-ish steps. Um, yeah. is, how, do you, how do you judge that? Is that like a minimum or is it purely trial and error? Is there such a thing as like an overtrained model? There is definitely a thing such as an overtrained model. We'll talk about this more in week four when we actually do some training. Um, I just generally have like in my head, I know that anything less than 3000 steps on our runway model is, is too low of training. Um, and it's usually like what it ends up being is it gets those like blobby, it very looks very blobby. Um, whereas you see that like that brutalist architecture model had very sharp, very like clear, pristine edges. Um, even if it wasn't perfect and I wouldn't say that model is perfect or like over like well-trained, um, the thing about runway is it'll generally Runway, because, because of certain timing and things, like people will generally undertrain the runway models because it's very expensive to, to train it for a long amount of time. Um, but runway gets you good enough. And that's sort of like what I think is, is good about runway. But many of the models I've seen that people have released are undertrained. Um, and that's just generally like, I know, what, I know what steps you generally need to produce to get like a well-trained model inside a runway. Anything else about style again? Cool, okay. Um, I think this thing is still exporting. Oh, no, it looks like it's finished. So let's take a look at it. So we're gonna download this video. Um, so you just click on the download button. Um, I will say like Runway's file management is like a black box to me. Things end up in all sorts of places. Um, so usually what I just do is like once it's open, I'll just like search for the video name and I'll find it. Um, I do think there's some settings. Like I think inside your settings, there's a way to set where things should go, yeah, your export directory. Um, so, but things still save different places and it's never really clear to me. Um, so in general, I just like sort of search and see where, where things landed. Um, <clears throat> looks like this down, downloaded it, downloaded to my desktop. So we can take a look at what we have. Mm -hmm. so let's go ahead and open. Yeah, so there you go. That was a um, 50 second video. The frame rate is pretty low. It's 10 frames per second or 10 frames per second just so I can like quickly generate it. Um, so it isn't like a perfectly animating video, um, but it's pretty interesting. And so you could generate 20 of these um, and all you're doing is paying runway to figure out like to just generate all those random points. Um, so again, this is fun to play with, but like if you want more control, which I think many of us do, um, I'll show you a technique to actually like have more control over these things. Uh, in the next couple weeks. Cool, so let's look at BigGAN. Um, so BigGAN um, is a different model from StyleGAN. Um, it was made by uh, the folks at Google. Um, Google is like obviously one of the big people making these things. Um, StyleGAN was made by the folks at NVIDIA, um, NVIDIA being the graphics cards makers. So um, machine learning models tend to run on graphics cards. So NVIDIA has a big R&D lab so that people buy more uh, graphics cards from them is essentially what that is. Um, so they're just two different models. They're slightly different in the way that they operate. Um, so when we look at BigGAN, um, you'll see over here that uh, the first thing there is there's a bunch of categories. Um, BigGAN is trained on what's, what's a data set called ImageNet. Um, I think ImageNet has something like 10,000 categories. I don't even know. There's like you could never actually scroll through this entire list and look at every one of these categories. Um, it's also tends to be trained on objects and animals. Um, so this is a case of where like I saw, like I know a lot of people are playing with Big Bigan. Um, big Bigan looks into Big Gan's model and tries to find the closest image to what's in the model. Um, so because Big Gan was trained on mostly animals and objects, if you try to put in anything that isn't an animal or an object, it's gonna find weird stuff as a result. Um, so if you actually look at um, how Big Gan is set up, you can actually sort of like, you could, I think in the case of what Judd was doing, which is like, oh, there's ducks in this model. Let me show it a duck and find the closest duck representation. Um, but you'll see here, there's stuff like, I don't even know what a, oh, a lemur or a Madagascar cat. Um, there's elephants, there's pandas. There's a number of different animals. If you want to produce animals, big gan's the way to go. Um, 
So we're going to start this model up and then we're going to pick one of these categories and then we'll sort of look and see what we can do with it from there. Um, the other thing to know about the difference between these two models is most StyleGAM models will be 1024 by 1024 pixels, um, which sounds small, but it's actually very large for machine learning models. I believe Big GAN is 256 by 256. So much more like postage size images. Um, they have a 512 by 512 model, but it's not on runway. I think probably because it takes forever to do and actually like upload. Um, so each of these will also have different resolutions. You can't control any of that. It's built in the model. Um, we'll talk about that more when we do training in StyleGAM because you do have to pick a size you want to train with. Um, and that has some uh, ramifications as well. Um, so it's also kind of like, there's all these like different variables about every machine learning mod model that you have to sort of figure out. Um, this is definitely going to take us a while to load this one up because it is a pretty big model to, to get set up. Um, we'll see how this goes. Hopefully it doesn't take us too much longer. Um, but yeah, so, so big GAN, um, you also can't train your own big GAN model. The reason for that is that the inputs this takes are something like probably like a hundred thousand images. Um, so you can't train your own big GAN model inside a runway because most of us don't have a hundred thousand images. Also labeling your image data is like a total nightmare. Um, I wouldn't want any of us, I actually might teach a class where like people have to label their own data. Um, but for this class, we certainly don't have time to sit, to sift through thousands of images and categorize them. That would be kind of chaotic. Um, so just so you know, you can't train your own big game model, but it's still a mod fun model to play with. Unless this doesn't spin up, in which case I'm gonna move on. But let's give it two more minutes and we'll see. I'm just gonna stop my style game model while, while we're here. Oh, looks like it might already be stopped. All right, give it one more minute. Um, I do, I'll probably do a demo next week of what's called chaining, which is um, combining a bunch of different models together. And I'll make sure we do big GAN for that one if this doesn't spin up. Um, this is a great case of where George called it. <laughs> called that we're gonna run into issues here. So I don't, sometimes, oh, there we go. Okay, I said a minute and it lasted literally a minute before we get started. So let's look at how this works. So again, we're gonna choose an input of vector um, and then I'm going to switch out. I want to do, I want to do our lemur here. Okay. So similar to what we saw in StyleGAM, there is a sampling distance and that controls this grid of images that controls, you know, how different are the Madagascar cats slash ringtail lemurs um, that we're looking at. So um, here we're at 0.5 and we'll like, these look like pretty similar uh, lemurs. Although this guy, like when you actually look at these up close, they are kind of frightening. Um, that one kind of has a very weird face. Um, let's crank this up to one and just sort of see what the, the big diversity would look like amongst this. So you'll see we get different scales, um, different poses. This one's kind of chunky and also looks like it's falling apart. Um, so again, with Big GAN, there's an opportunity here to um, just create a bunch of different uh, images. They're all within these categories. So the problem is that you can't really um, go from one category to another um, very easily, right? So if I delete this um, and I want to pick, let's say a bullfrog this time, it'll just reload. So I can't really look at, like I can't look at categories side by side, I can only look within one category, um, the various images. Now, and maybe, let's see if we can do this with, so we can do another latent walk with these, but again, you can only do a latent walk within a category. So you can't say go from a goldfish to a uh, lemur. Um, this doesn't support it. Um, I don't even know if we could, I don't know if we can even do that in P5. You can do it outside of runway, but uh, it's probably not possible within here. So um, here again, this is a different model, um, has slightly different outputs. Oh, this is a 512 model. Okay, so this is 512. Um, you'll see the output right here. So um, 
I think there might also be a 2PZ6 version somewhere in here, but basically that's it. Um, so that sort of covers everything for vector inputs. Um, I generally just use it to sort of see what's in my model and to be able to like pull out a couple highlighted images and then I can use something like p5.js to uh, interpolate between those. Um, any last questions about vector inputs? Cool. Um, let's jump over to style transfer. Um, so I feel like style transfer was the first version of like machine learning that really got big. Um, and it had sort of that, the only thing I would I describe it as a, describe as the fart app moment of like machine learning where it was like everyone released like a style GAN app where you could like take a selfie of yourself in like a certain style of someone. Um, and that got really popular for like six months to a year. And then people stopped using style transfer because they, they said it was like played out. Um, I unfortunately, I think that's kind of sad because there's a lot of opportunities for style transfer. Um, but most of the versions people have seen are the versions of like, make yourself into the style of Starry Night or whatever it is. Um, so this is the famous style transfer paper. Um, this is the one every, if you've talked to any machine learning person, they'll, they'll refer to the Gaddis at all. Um, this is, you, if you want to read the paper, you can. Um, I would say the images again in there are much easier to understand than, than the uh, paper itself. Um, but essentially what it does, is it takes a photo. So this is a photo of a house, looks somewhere in, in Europe. Um, and then you can apply the styles of different paintings or different images to the content of this image, right? So in this case, you've got Starry Night um, applied to this image, um, the scream applied to this image, and it picks up the textures of these paintings and applies them to the content image. Um, so again, the way this works is, is you have two images. So you have a content image and you have a style image uh, and you combine them and you run it through your model and you get an output image um, that attempts to take some of the style from the style image and apply it to content image. Now, I think in my case, in this example, like I would look at this and I would say like, this doesn't really seem like the textures from this image, right? It picked up the colors and it picked up some of the texture, but it didn't really pick up a lot of the texture. And this is one of the problems we're gonna see with a lot of style transfer models is that you end up with a case like this, where it sort of colorizes your image and it creates some weird artifacts, but doesn't really pick up the texture. Um, and this is one of the other problems that a lot of people produced various style transfer models for various reasons. And people said, this sucks. It doesn't actually do what we want it to do. Um, so again, the inputs for this are content and a style image. And the output is a combined version of those two. Um, if you're really interested in understanding how this works, um, this gets into a little bit more of deep learning and machine learning than I generally cover in this class, but essentially what you're seeing along the top here. So the reason that we have a thing called deep learning is deep learning just implies there's layers of an architecture. So these network models that they build have different layers inside of them. Um, and you will often hear these called convolution neural networks or CNNs. Um, in this particular example, what, they're, what they found is that they found at each of these layers, you get different types of texture or different types of content. So what they found is that, you know, at these higher layers, you get these like um, very sort of like noisy images, right? So this is like a very noisy sort of construction. But then when you get down to this layer, you get something that actually like seems like the texture of Starry Night, right? You see, you get a little bit of these, uh, the starry swirls, or sorry, the moon swirls, you get a little bit more of the texture things. And likewise, when you look at a photographic image or a content image, um, you do see that at certain layers, you get a very good representation of uh, the image, the content itself. And then at other layers, you get very noisy versions. Um, and basically through some very like high level math, you essentially add these layers together. So if I were to take a layer here, like layer E, and add it to layer B, I would probably get something that is more like this image here. Um, and in the end, that's what a lot of these like models are doing is they're just doing some very, very complicated math to be able to pull out certain textures or certain content styles of these images. Um, so this is actually kind of how Deep Dream works as well. Um, Deep Dream takes those layers from those networks. Um, and each of those layers ends up having its own representation and you sort of like excite or like enhance those layers um, so that the image like pulls out those properties a lot. So that's how you get some of those like very weird swirly guys or like weird animals or there's a thing called puppy slugs, which are like the combined layer of a puppy and a slug. And like, that's how you get some weird images out of that. So that's, this is, you'll hear a lot of people in, in um, especially in 
machine learning art talk about what layer are you using or what layers are you using? And that's sort of what this refers to. So inside of Runway, there are eight different uh, style transfer models. There were seven until last night when I uploaded my own. Um, so each of these has a different sort of approach and different like way in which it works. Um, so, you know, you'll see that actually there was one called Neural Style. I uploaded my own version of Neural Style that has a couple other additional features. Um, we'll probably look at this one last, um, just so I can sort of show you why I prefer this version. Um, but basically you could walk through all seven or eight of these models and you would get totally different results from each one of them. Um, so there's one called Fast Photo Style, which I will, like I'll just quickly walk through like what each of these is meant to do. So Fast Photo Style, um, or actually let's talk about these two on the left here. Neural Style, this is, the, this is based on the original paper. Um, so these models are fairly slow, but they're highly accurate. Um, so we'll actually look at this, like producing a good res image with one of my, with this model that I uploaded is pretty slow. It takes five to 10 minutes. So it is definitely like not an ideal like version to use if you want to just play with something fast. Um, whereas there's two versions here, there's a fast style transfer and a fast photo style. Fast style transfer, um, you can't upload your own style image. You have to use a pre, it's basically like they use what is almost like a style again training model where it's been trained to work with this, but it is very fast. It will, it will give you a new image back very quickly. Um, fast photo style is for converting um, photo to photos. So you have a content photo and a, and a style photo, but it's for photos. So you don't want to upload a, um, you don't upload a painting to this model because it's really about converting uh, photographic styles. So colors or um, even like sort of like uh, texture or grain, I guess would be like a, a good way of describing it. Um, it's really for combining two photo styles. Um, and then I actually don't remember what each of like these other four models does differently. Some of them um, don't support uploading con your own style image. Um, I believe some of them, um, they all have different like sort of varying usages. So this is again, like this is kind of one of the hard parts about Runway is like, which one of these do I start working with? Um, and I don't really have a good answer than to say like, if you really want to produce high quality print, like not necessarily print level, but like very good textures, I would say stick to one of the neural style versions just because they're sort of set up for that. Whereas the other ones are, are set up a little bit more to, um, to be a little bit faster or to give you better feedback on things. Um, so um, let's take a look at a couple of these versions. I've loaded them into, um, into Runway in a workspace already. And we can just sort of like quickly generate um, a couple of different images. So let's first look at, um, so we've got these here. Um, let's just, re I'm gonna rename this. And we're just gonna call this uh, style transfer. So when you click into each one of these models, you can sort of see just by looking at the interface, what's available to you here. So in this very first one, adaptive style transfer, um, I can pick an input of a file or a camera. So let's actually just use my camera um, and we'll just use my, my mug up here and see how this goes. Um, so you'll see there's no option here for a style image, right? There's only pre-trained style images. And you'll see there's a Cezanne, there's a Pollock, there's a Kandinsky, there's an El Greco. So I like, if I want a famous, again, if I want the fart app version of these, uh, this is what I can pick from, right? So I can pick from some of these. So let's actually just run this really quickly and see how, how this works. I'm actually, you know what? So there's a feature inside of, um, the runway workspaces that says start all models. So I'm just gonna run this. I don't really recommend, oh, you can't even do this, okay. Um, usually you can run a couple models at once. Oh, you can run up to five, five models at once. So I'm just gonna click, uh, just turn this on and we'll just go and we'll look at a couple of these examples as this runs. Um, while this is getting set up, let's look at dynamic style transfer. So here again, um, this only has an input. Um, so I can only input, so again, let's switch this to the camera. Actually, this one's already set up, so let's just see where this one goes. Hmm, I wonder if it's because my camera is the input for both of these that this doesn't work. Let's see. Oh, that works, okay. So, um, the results here are pretty good. Um, I'd say the texture is kind of nice, but again, I don't, I don't really get to control what my style images. So I'm just sort of working with what they've given me, which is waterfall. Um, so there's different options in this one than there would be say an adaptive style transfer. Whereas adaptive style transfer is more like famous painters. This one is sort of more like famous paintings. Um, 
So let's turn this one off now that we've seen how this one works. Let's go to adaptive style transfer. Let's look at this one. So I can sort of say that this, I don't like this model. Like it's pretty messy, it's pretty blurry. I guess maybe that's good for a Cezanne. I don't really know. Um, hey, stop. Um, but yeah, so this is just sort of like, you can sort of see, I don't, I don't love the results of this one. So we're gonna turn this model off. So let's look at fast style transfer. So here again, I'm sort of limited in, in what I can do with these, right? Again, I don't have a style option, so I really have to just sort of work with what they're giving me. But you'll see this one's way faster. Like the results, it's getting a much better frame rate um, compared to the other ones. Um, and my guess is like my laptop is about to explode. So it's like, it'd probably be faster if I had quit all my other applications and done some other things. But I'm getting some good results here. Um, like this Cubist photo is like pretty decent. The, the, I can make out my face fairly well, which is always a good sign. So let's stop this one. And let's come back to Ada in. So now we had our first image model where we can upload both a content and a style image. Um, so let's go ahead and do this really quickly. So I'm going to upload a file. Um, I've currently been really, really digging this Rihanna photo in all my demos. If you like follow my Instagram account, this is the only image I use right at the moment. Um, and then let's pick a file uh, to actually use. So I've also been working off of uh, move the Zoom guy out of the way. Um, So you'll see this like very thin blue gradient like that is sort of animating. Um, that means it's running. So it's a good sign. Even though I've got this like warning sign here, I think it is because I started the model without having inputs already set up in it. Um, but you'll see that it is still running. So as long as you've seen this blue gradient sort of animating, um, that's a good sign that you're doing okay. Um, I don't know how fast this model is. Um, I guess it's Usually you have both a, a style and a content image. It tends to be a little bit slower just because it has to actually compute both variables or both images together. Um, also I realize that this is a very high resolution image at the moment. Um, and this is going to be mad at me because, so the other thing I recommend is that in a lot of cases, um, don't start with a high res image. Um, so this is, by high res I mean like 1200 pixels. Like if you're a print designer, that sounds like a crazy concept of that being high res. Um, but for this work, I would generally say, you probably want to start with something like 400 pixels and you can just crank this down. Um, this is already running. It did produce my image. Let's see what happens. Cool. So, um, so this produced an image. It took 10.8 seconds, which actually isn't bad. That's not a terrible amount of time. Um, and it is 1200 by 1200. Um, I'm looking at, so like the other thing is you can sometimes make this bigger. I'll also say like, I don't think this is the best result. Um, in my experience, you can get much better looking results with this. Like if you look at this, um, let's look at the content image here at the top. Like this doesn't really represent this content image. Like I'm not getting this texture, which I really wanted or liked out of it. Um, and you know, the colors are, don't seem to be really representative of what I see here. Um, so I don't know, maybe it's something to do with model, maybe it's something to do with the images I chose. Um, kind of one of the downsides of these things is to try to figure out what, what's going on here. Um, there is also a version here. So I'm actually gonna make the, my image size smaller. Um, make this 600. Um, I also wanna turn on preserved color. Let's see if this actually lets me do this. Sometimes when you mess with these inference options while you're generating a model, um, as you change values, it spins up a new instance of that image. And you can like start to get a cascade of where you've got a bunch of different options here. Um, so this looks like it's already working a little bit better. Like the texture's already showing up here. So one of the things that I find a lot has to do with style transfer is the size of your image and the size of your style, like, or sorry, the style of your, the size of your content image and the size of your style image matter a lot. So if you, um, you know, make the content image smaller and the um, style image larger, it's going to pick up more of the texture from the style image. Um, whereas, you know, what you saw before, which was that 1200 by 1200, um, had a lot less of the texture from the style image because it was a little bit larger than the, or 
yes, it was, the content image was larger than the style image. Um, I'm gonna download this just so we can compare these two. Um, so now this one is running. I'm gonna stop this one and let's take a look at, I'm gonna actually just skip ahead. There's a bunch of other models in here. This one also allows you to, well, actually let's, let's do this one really quickly. Let's do, um, this one does both images as well. So let's just grab both of these and, and do this as well really quickly. And we can compare all three together when we're done. Um, there's Rihanna. Um, Runway will yell at you when you upload too high res of an image um, because there's a chance you could actually max out the GPU and it would re return an error. In my experience, if you upload a 1200 pixel image, you'll be fine. Um, but it's still good to just be reminded like, hey, this image is high resolution. If you upload something like really, lit, really big, like 3000 pixels, um, it will definitely like max at your GPU and you won't be able to get an image from it. So images do usually have to be of a certain size. Um, the nice thing is that inside of, uh, inside a runway, you can actually just change those image values. You can turn them down a lot. You can just, so usually before I even start running a model, I'll make this a lot smaller. I'll make this 600. And then let's grab um, that texture image again. And let's just leave that as is. What other options are here? So I have an on top option for an interpolation weight. So I don't actually know what that means, but let's just run this and see what happens. And while this gets going, I'm actually gonna run this one. Um, so I've actually already been experimenting. This is my version of the model. Um, so one of the things you'll see here is, let's see. And it always really slow right now. I think it's just my laptop. Um, so here we go. So we've got an image here. Is it the right one? This is the right one. Okay. So look at this one. Um, I don't really even know. This one's really not my favorite at all. Um, so here you go. We'll see that we have a 600 by, six, 600 by 600 constant image and 1024 by 1024 for the style image. And it produced a lot of just noise. Like I don't, I don't even really know what exactly this was trying to do. Um, but it definitely didn't work the way I expected it to. Like maybe let me change the interpolation weight and see what happens here. Um, I do notice this was faster. It was eight seconds versus um, the, well, also I notice here's what happened is it only outputs to 256 by 256. So that's another thing to know is that some of these are also forcing your images into certain sizes. Um, so this is better-ish, I guess, but this is still like not my favorite version of a style transfer. So each of these is a little different and this is kind of the weird part of this. Um, let me quickly jump to mine and we can sort of sh I can show you sort of like how various pieces of mine work. Um, is this mine? This one's mine. Um, so you'll see in mine that there's a couple more options up here. There's a thing called uh, original colors, which will use the original colors from your model. Um, there's another one called max iterations. Um, iterations means how many times it runs um, on the image. And then there's a thing called style scale. And style scale is like the thing that I, like this is my number one feature that I wish all style transfer models had and none of the runway, ha runway ones have until this. Um, so style scale allows me to manipulate the scale of the style image so that I can really like get fine tuned textures out of it um, in a much better way. So this is actually the model, this is a, the image you generate from it. Now, one thing to note is that it took 366 seconds, which is what, uh, that's like six minutes, is that right? Um, 360 divided by 60, yeah, six minutes. So this is very slow. Um, and this will obviously cost you more money because of your, because of Runway's way that it charges you five cents per minute of running stuff. So you have to sort of decide like, do I want high quality images for a little bit more money or do I want to play with stuff? Um, but basically that's how this one works. I'm going to set this up and run and we'll play with a couple of these options here. Um, in general, the way that I would work with one of these models, which is slower, is I would, make my, my image sizes very small to start with. So maybe 360, maybe 400 pixels wide. Um, that way it's gonna happen a little bit faster. The other thing that uh, manages your speed is the max iterations. Um, you could crank this up to a thousand and it would probably take about 20, 15, 20 minutes to produce an image, but you might get a little bit more of a crisp detail. Um, whereas you could set it to 200 and you would get an idea of what the image is gonna look like. Um, so that's sort of the difference here. Um, I generally have found that I don't 
personally like anything over 600 iterations, but that's just my personal style. Um, so you could play with this. Um, so, you know, again, because of the, because you want to sort of, in this particular ver version, you don't want to waste six minutes at a time to generate these, you might want to start small. So let's actually, like, I'm going to turn this down a lot. Um, and I'm going to set this to 0.25. And of course, this model takes forever to, to get started up. Um, but you'll see here already, like, I would say my personal feeling, um, and I am clearly biased because it's the model I use all the time, um, and therefore I like it more. Um, I personally find this image far more, far more useful than this other one, right? So like we compare this image to this image, this feels like a, this feels like the accurate style transfer to me, right? If I look at this, this style image, like that feels like an accurate depiction of combining these two images together. Um, and I think this is one of the things is like many people don't, many people do not see these models inside runway and use so many other style transfer models. And they're like, style transfer sucks. Why would I use this? And I just personally find like this one works better. Um, this might take 10 minutes to get spun up. I don't know what's going on here. But anyway, this is, um, this is the joy of runway is that there are lots of models. And that means you can play with them a lot, but you can also waste your time working with a model that isn't really great. Um, so if you're ever stuck and be like, I want to do one of these type of models, which one should I work with? Um, you can always ask my Slack channel, either ask me directly or just ask, there's a runway channel in my Slack channel. Um, and you can ask for certain things. Um, I'll, I'm actually going to record probably a longer video this week uh, just to demo all the various features of this model. Um, and I'll upload that for folks as well, just so they can sort of see. The problem is because this is slow, it's tough to demo it, right? It's like, we're going to wait five minutes, change a value, wait five minutes, change a value. Um, but I do actually think this is really, really good for style transfer if you're interested in playing more with style transfer. Um, I'll see if this runs any longer, but um, we've got about 10, 15 minutes left in class. Also, I know we had some technical difficulties, so I'm happy to stick around later if people have more questions. Um, but really quickly, let's look at what your homework assignments are for this week. Um, so two things. So one, I want you to start thinking about data sets. Um, I think last week I shared um, some data set videos and tutorials that I have. Um, I would definitely recommend just checking out a couple of them. If anything, check out the very first one that just explains data sets as a whole. Um, and then also start to think about like where you might be able to gather images. So I know Adi, it sounded like you were already trying to grab some images, which is great. Um, for other folks, if you haven't started thinking about this, think about maybe where you would find some images. Um, I will say that it's really easy to scrape Instagram. So if you know some good Instagram accounts, we could always start there. Um, we'll talk about the ethics of scraping websites and Instagram accounts next week. But I'd say for like this demo, you can do whatever you want. Like it doesn't matter. Um, but I would say if you're going to share your model after class is over, you might want to let the artist know um, or whoever that you're scraping stuff from because they don't want to see their images uh, repurposed without having checked in with them. But either way, like definitely start to look around. Instagram, if you have never done data scraping before, Instagram will be the easiest version for you. Um, but I'm happy if you have something custom in mind and you've never done it, I'm happy to walk you through it. So start thinking about that. Uh, we'll talk more about that next week, like how to actually build a data set, steps to go through it. But I would recommend I would recommend checking out some of those videos before we get into it. Um, the second assignment is to just keep exploring models. So I saw like a lot of people were going through a bunch of different models. Um, there's probably some cool ones. Maybe now you've understand style transfer a little bit more and want to play with those. Maybe now you understand vector inputs and you want to play with more of those. Just sort of dig into it and sort of see what you uh, find. Um, I would also say like again as you make stuff, just share it directly to Slack. Like there's no time requirement to be like, I have to upload an hour before class, just upload it whenever. I'm um, also happy to give you feedback if you're interested in any of that stuff. So um, those are your two assignments for the week. Um, again, it should be pretty simple, but I would start thinking about data sets because the data set collection takes a long time uh, or just figuring out what, what accounts you can even scrape from or it takes a long time. Um, so as a reminder, usually you need about 500 to 1,000 images um, to do a good training within StyleGAN. So if you find an Instagram account you love, but it only has 250 images, you might need to find another Instagram account that can like offset that. Uh, you can also scrape hashtags. So if you know there's a hashtag you really like to use, like you can scrape from that as well. Um, the downside of scraping Instagram is that usually you will get people's selfies in addition to their art or like hashtags are like notoriously bad at like being spammed. So if you like love a hashtag, but you scrape it and there's like, 
a bunch of images in there that don't have anything to do with the hashtag, it's because people are the worst and they're trying to like game Instagram or whatever. Um, so just know that there will be some cleanup you have to do after that as well. Um, so don't just like wait to the last minute and be like, cool, I'm gonna scrape this account. And then you find out it's got like 2000 images and only 500 are worthwhile. So we'll talk about that more next week, but do start to think about it a little bit more. Um, let me just see if this runway model started up. It did not. So I'll record a video on how to use this particular model because it is mine and I like know all the tips and tricks about it. Um, so I'll record a video and put that up on my YouTube channel and share it with folks if they're interested. Um, so at this point, class is over. Um, I'm happy to take more questions and stick around if people have questions about either things they particularly worked on or um, you know, things about data sets, anything you want to talk about. Quick question on data set, Derek. Yeah. Um, so if we were going to generate our own images from our own personal artwork, um, is there a size, if we're scanning an artwork, like parameter, yeah. what's the parameters? So I would recommend if you're gonna do that, um, scan fairly high res. Um, whatever that means to you or whatever size you have available. I have a tool that we'll look at next week that'll help you batch resize everything um, and crop things to squares. So for style gam models, they do need to be square and they do need to be, I would recommend that everyone do 1024 models. You just get nice resolution. Um, they tend to train a little bit slower, but they'll, they just, they're nicer and you can like almost print out a 1024 by 1024. Um, so yeah, I would probably recommend like something at least that, that size or larger. Um, and then I'll show you some tools I have that will allow you to do cropping really simply. Um, or if you want to like really customize all that stuff, you can do your own cropping to squares as well. What other questions do folks have? Out of curiosity, what would happen if you trained a model using just a hundred photos? Yeah, so we'll talk about that more in week four. Um, there's a potential for a thing called overfitting, which basically means that it memorizes the images and then it like, you don't get those really nice interpolation videos. Like instead of it sort of being flowing and changing, it just like skips, it just jumps from image to image. I will say that I think uh, Runway's training does a good job of managing that and making sure it doesn't actually happen. Um, but in general, the more images you have, the more likely you are to get good results out of it. I should say 500 to 1,000 is what I recommend. If you have 5,000 images, that's actually awesome. Like the more images you have of a certain like style or whatever is actually gonna be better. Um, so it's kind of up to you. It just depends on what you have. I find most people have less than that than than they do more often more than that. So that's why I say 500 to 1,000. Um, also add that if you just don't want to, if you don't want to get data sets, um, I have some pre-done data sets you're welcome to use as well. If you just want to like learn what the training process is, but don't want to actually like have to go to the effort of making your data set, I'm happy to send you some stuff. I find that most people are willing to do that work because it's really exciting and fun to train their own models. So I just make that offer in case. What, what would happen if you took a bunch of screenshots from like a video would your data be really weak or would that yeah so video is actually really interesting um so video actually tends to be um what happens is that it sort of learns the video and it can replay parts of it but it can't replay all of it um or like it skips around in weird places um so i've definitely like i've a bunch of students in my classes have done video before and it definitely produces interesting results but i would say it doesn't produce anything shockingly new it doesn't like it's more like the video itself is interesting but like the images themselves are sort of like just repetitive of what you've already seen um let me actually grab i'm gonna grab an example really quickly from a previous class or like a place that i've done some stuff and i'll share that in the slack channel um while i find it uh if anyone else has questions i'm happy to answer those as well Yeah, you know what, I, might, I'm, I probably won't be able to find it for right now, but I'll, I'll upload it um, tonight so people can see it. 
Derek, quick question. Um, on when you were in runway running the, um, sorry, the last style gun, there yeah. was a tab that said network. What is that? Is that for advanced users? I'm just um, curious what that tab's about. Yeah, so we'll look at that actually uh, in the last week of class. Network allows you to speak to other, um, using either OSC or localhost, it allows you to talk to other applications. So they have an integration for Unity, Photoshop. Um, we'll look at P5.js, um, which is just running in a browser window. Um, so you can interact with those models over like a network connection. Um, does anyone have an idea for a data set that they want to tell me about or tell the group about and I can sort of talk through how you might go ahead and get it? Um, not to talk so much, sorry. No, it's fine. No. Uh, there is this Instagram account called Japanese Vans and it's just like a uh, mm. van from Japan from the 90s. Okay. And they're all either custom kits and all this. I think it's, I have to look it up. It might be there, but wondering doing a data set on that. Yeah. Japanese vans is the, and there's just all these. Cool. Yeah. yeah I mean, I think this would definitely work. The problem I see already is that they only have 322 posts. So uh, they might have, like, it looks like they do have some, well, even the ones that are slideshows um, or like multiple images are just interior sh shots. So what we might need to do is like find another account that's like Australian vans and like merge those two together or something. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is like, this is definitely like an ideal sort of data set because it clearly has like one focus and it is not like, they're not throwing in crappy like promos for other things in here. So this would definitely be like, if you could find another couple like I would actually be interested in just training. We could try it just on this 320 um, images, but if we find another one that's like this, like I think this would be a really ideal set to work with. Yeah. I'm gonna post this in the Slack channel so people can see what we're talking about. But yeah, stuff like this where it's like very niche, but like perfectly curated are great data sets, yeah. Out of curiosity, I was I was thinking about um, scraping old type specimens um, because there are, there are a bunch of data sets or not not data sets just like image collections that I've seen in the past from from old uh, like uh, wood type um, data libraries and whatnot. It'd be just interesting to see what would happen um, to all the letters. Um, I will, so like, I think that's a definitely a cool thing to check out. I will warn everyone that typography is like a weird place where it gets very messy in Salgan because it just, it, for whatever reason, it's just, it can't read the letters very well. Um, so it tends to turn to a lot of soup. So um, definitely just to set your expectations for that. Like it's definitely a cool thing to check out, but it doesn't always work out the way you expect it to. That was, um, so Jason, who did that typography version, that was sort of what he found out. And he was like, kind of have to like, fake it and make it look cool together by like adding in the original samples as well. So, yeah. What about something like um, camouflage or gradients? Yeah, so camouflage would be cool to check out. Gradients are interesting. Um, I haven't ever seen anyone train a StyleGAN model on gradients. One thing I will tell you is that uh, the way that StyleGAN looks is it looks for shapes. It looks for uh, patterns or textures. And I worry that a, that a gradient model would kind of turn like weird because there's no, there's no edges, right? Like mm -hmm. these models are sort of meant to find edges and then learn from those edges. Um, so it'd be interesting to sort of see what it did do with that. Um, yeah, it's so much of this stuff is like, well, how much money do you want to spend on a potentially bad result? Um, who knows? I'd be down to try it. Um, also I just say like, so like in this class, I would love everyone to try to train at least one model, but if you train one and it comes out kind of crappy and you want to do another one and you don't want to spend money on it, just let me know. Like I have a bunch of credits because the Romy guys are always giving me credits for, to teach these classes. Like I'm happy to train a second model if you're like, don't want to spend extra money and you're just sort of disappointed in your models. Um, but I also find that people sometimes get addicted to this. So like I had one student who like 
probably went through like four or five different models in a five eight class. She just got really into it, and she's like, I can collect all this stuff. Like, she had young kids, so she was like, they'll watch TV and I'll work on a model together, and that's our like evening. Um, so it's kind of like there is some, it's sort of therapeutic to like do all this data scraping and like munging and cleaning up your data. So it is kind of fun. Some people get really into it and some people are like, I hate this. This is the worst experience on, that, on earth. So um, everyone will find their own way, but I'm happy to help people in any way that I can with, with stuff. So, yeah. And then another idea um, for some of the text generated um, pieces, I played around with that a little bit, but would there be any way to like, let's say you took a particular lyricist or hip hop artist and you fed it their entire genius catalog or whatever, all of all their lyrics, would that be something where you then it would kind of learn their cadence, their vocabulary and could do generative things based off of that? Yeah, so that's exactly how GPT-2 works. Um, mm -hmm. I don't really cover GPT in this class, but there are videos. So the runway folks have videos on how to do that stuff. So if you are mm -hmm. interested, like go ahead and just follow that. And I'm happy to help with things. Um, it's a little just out of my wheelhouse. Like I sort of understand how GPT-2 works, but um, I'm happy to help if I can in those places. But um, cool. we'll say that's like, I would say the scope of this class, but I'm still happy to help. Yeah. Derek, one, another question. Say for um, like, if you took uh, a record label like Blue Note, which has obviously square format being LPs, but uh, they have kind of a consistent visual language. Could you run a style again on say their record covers? Yeah, I think you could. Um, we'll talk about this a little bit more next week, but there's a question here of what, what I would def describe as diversity. Um, so in the case of something like the Japanese vans, Japanese vans are good because they all have a similar shape, right? And I think blue note covers would be good because they all tend to be like photographs of like the band playing in like the studio and then like a color tint over it. So it would probably pick up like the band and like try to recreate lots of different band photos. Um, in some cases I've seen where people try to like just take a whole collection of different album covers and stick it together and it just gets very muddy because there's like you know, you've got death metal and then you've got jazz. You, like each of the styles for these like genres is different and the model just can't figure out how to like keep all those together. So I'd say like, I have seen there is a death metal uh, style GAN that looks really cool. Like it definitely learns all the weird, like sharp, like Gothic lettering. Um, so in general, like try to find places where like the style is very similar or like, again, think about the textures, the textures are similar. Um, but yeah, it's like this, like, it's always this question of like how diverse versus like way too similar, like this sort of thing. So yeah. Um, I have a question. Yeah. It's kind of the opposite. If I was interested in maybe an object, but they're all like very different style in the sense of color, would it be easier like turning all of them black and white? Mm. So like the transition between shapes is better? Yeah, that's a great question. I don't, I don't think I've seen anyone do that, but that would certainly make sense to me. If, if you don't want, like, so basically the way I describe this is that any image or sets of images you're feeding to this model are things you're saying are acceptable outputs. So if you don't want it to interpret color as an output, then yes, converting everything to black and white is going to sort of like eliminate that from its array of choices. Um, one of my students last week or last class um, did a model of lamps like just generating like old mid-century or like earlier lamps. Um, and like, that was a really cool model. Cause again, it was all the similar objects. And I think it was mostly, I don't know if it was grayscale photos, but all the outputs ended up being sort of black and white. Um, I'll find a link to that as well. Um, that was pretty cool. Yeah. Would like different colors, like if all the objects, different shapes had different colors, would it affect how the shapes are perceived in the final model? Or yeah, like if all your round shapes were blue and all of your angular shapes were red, it would definitely learn that correlation. Um, you might get some, it might try to find some, it might try to produce some red images of circles. And that would be sort of like, when we talk about truncation values, like that would be at the edges of truncation values because it's less likely to appear in its data set. Um, but yeah, you could, you could also influence some things that way by like purposely color coding things and seeing if that returns similar results, yeah.
Any other questions? Uh, Derek, I just sent a, a link in the, the chat to, yeah. um, it's an old, um, mm. like, uh, scientific artist named um, Ernst Henkel. Yeah. He did all these these weird um, studies on, on wildlife, animals, plants, um, a lot of biology uh, focused uh, illustrations. Would that would something like that work? Because his his formats tended to be the same, but the the subject matter was so all over the place. Yeah. Um, so I'll also say like another really good place to look at. It feels kind of out of date at this point, but is Flickr. Um, there's lots of people have like archives of images and stuff of Flickr. Um, so yes, I think his work would work if you can find lots of images of it. Um, the other option is, um, so one of the data set libraries that I use very often is a place called Biodiversity Heritage Library. Um, let me see if I can just grab, they have a Flickr account. Uh, here we go. I'll post this link in the chat and I'll also add it to our Slack channel. Um, they have a number of, um, oops. Send to everyone, there we go. Um, so they just collect, botanical illustration books and other things. Um, and they have a whole website that is, and you can get high, really high res prints of all the, or really high res scans of all these things. Um, that tends to be one of the sources that a lot of my work comes from. Um, so basically if you find libraries that also like have lots of images, like there's usually good repositories for stuff like that as well. Um, and I think I've seen some of his work on this uh, biodiversity library or in other places. Um, also, the other nice thing is a lot of those things tend to be out of copyright. So there's no like legal or ethical requirements about like, you know, what sort of, what, what do I owe people? Um, most of those things are at, like older books are out of copyright, which is also like very helpful in some of this work as well. If you want to turn this into like a commercial project, which no one's doing for this class. So it's not like a requirement of this class, but just for future considerations, stuff out of copyright is always nice to use. Thanks. Um, so I also have a demo on how to scrape Flickr. Um, it takes a little bit more work, um, but it does work well. So if there's accounts or things, the nice thing about Flickr too is that um, they have a search function that is all of their Creative Commons work. So if you, again, are concerned about legal and ethical issues, um, you can search and just scrape Creative Commons stuff and then you'll get uh, images that people are allowing people to use copyright free. And I should say one last thing about scraping is like, uh, it will generally require you to use the command line. Um, I don't really teach the command line in this class because I don't really expect anyone to have to know how to use it. Um, if you want to use it and you want to do that, uh, I'm happy to sort of like get you up to speed on it. If you are not comfortable and you just want to be like, hey, can you like scrape some of this stuff for me? I'm happy to set up some time to just like sort of do the process for you. Just this class is really about like, I want you to get, I want you to have a fun time training some stuff. So I'm happy to help you grab stuff if, if I can. Just gotta let me know and give me some heads up because I it does take a little bit of time. Um, usually takes a couple hours to get it set up. My machine's all set up to do that, so I can do it for people pretty quickly if, if it's helpful. Cool. Um, it is 9:15, so I want to make sure everyone gets like on with their nights or their kids or has dinner or whatever. So unless people have other questions, um, we can call it a night and I'll see everybody next week. Um, but I'll always say like, you're always welcome to reach out to me on, on Slack or over email and I'm happy to help in anything I can. Cool. All right. Awesome. Thanks everybody. Um, thank you for putting up with the technical details or technical issues this week. Um, I'm going to keep my laptop plugged in and a fan blowing on it. So it doesn't blow up on me again. Um, really appreciate it. Uh, and really excited to see everyone's work so far this week. Please keep sharing more. I'd love to see it. Um, and also if you're ever making stuff and you want me to share stuff on social, like just tag me. Um, I think you probably all have my socials, but if you're interested, like let me know and I'm happy to like retweet or share stuff. Um, Cause I, love, I just love to see everybody producing things. So yeah, cool. All right. Have a good week, everybody. And I'll see you next week. Thank you. Bye. Bye.